In this web lab, we will style our form using best practices. Have you heard of modular CSS before? Well, in this video, we're going to implement it. The idea is to make sure that the CSS you're writing isn't going to affect more than it's supposed to. We accomplish this by scoping our CSS rules. In my backyard, there are three trees. If I have a rule that says the leaves should be the color orange, all the leaves on all three trees will turn orange. The scope of this rule is global, meaning all the leaves on all the trees. And I don't want that. Now let's look at a scoped example. I can scope the rules to only affect the oak tree like this. Then only the leaves on the oak tree are changed. This is now a scoped rule that affects only the leaves on the oak tree. I hope that makes sense. This may be new to some of you, but it is possible to style HTML elements using specific attributes. In the form we just built, we have eight different types of inputs. This should look familiar. If I apply a color to the input tag, all eight inputs will be changed to deep pink. In most cases, this is not what I want to happen. Instead, I will change my input to use an attribute selector like this. Now only the inputs with a type equals text attribute will change their color to deep pink. It's like the trees in my yard. This will make more sense in a minute. In the last video, I used the brackets code editor. In this video, I'm going to switch to VS Code. In order to properly scope our CSS, we need to give our form a class of its own. Open your form page and add a custom class. I'm going to use WF1, which stands for Web Form 1. Open your small CSS file and add a comment to start a form styling section. Let's start by styling the three field sets which you remember are used to chunk our form into manageable sections. It's good design when you have a large form. We will scope our field set rules by starting with the form class WF1 and then field set. Let's add some margin to the top and bottom to move these three sections away from each other. Then let's add a thin border which is solid and light gray. I also like to soften my design with a small border radius. Finally, we will provide space inside the field set using padding. Next, we'll style the legends, which are also scoped with the form class of WF1. Let's change the color to blue. Notice how the gray line is really close to the text. Let's create more space here by using padding on the left and right. Okay, that looks good. Now notice that everything is on a single line. If you remember, each of these inputs are wrapped inside a label tag. Let's style the labels next. Remember to scope the label selector. Let's change the labels from inline elements to block elements. That should make them all stack nicely from top to bottom. As you can see, they are all squished together. Let's add some padding to the top. I will also change the color to red and reduce the font size just a tiny bit. We will do more work on these in a minute, but for now I need to take care of these two subheadings here and here. The text is too big and the spacing is off. Remember, these are wrapped in division tags. We will select them like this. Add padding to the top so they are visually chunked with the items below. Chunking is a design principle we talked about earlier. I will also change the color to match the legend color. Remember, good design has repetition in color. I will also reduce the font size to match the font size of our labels. Remember that one of our form best practices is that the user instructions are above the input areas. Two of our three sections are this kind the applicant information section here, and the funding section down here. 
This is where we get to use our attribute selector that I talked about earlier. Let's begin with scoping our selector using the class WF1, followed by input, and then square brackets containing type equals text. To test what is being affected, let's temporarily set the background color to deep pink. That should be bright enough to see. Wow, that is intense. As you can see, the first and last name changed color. If we look at the HTML, we can see that both of these are type equals text. Let's keep adding selectors until we have all the ones where the user instructions should be above the input. Let's add one for tell, one for email, one for URL. Down here we need to add one for date, one for select, and one for number. Wait a minute, why is this one not changing color? Well, if we look at our HTML, we can see that it is not an input, but a select instead. Let's change our CSS to select, like this, and now it works great. Now that we have correctly selected the items that should be stacked, we can start applying real CSS. Start by displaying these as blocks. That should stack everything like this. Let's add a solid, thin, gray border and a small border radius. Since these need to be the minimum size for touchscreens, we need to add padding to get them at least 44 pixels tall. Let's change the text color to gray. So when the user types, they see gray. Let's set the width to 100%, which works great for phones. However, this will be too much on a large screen. So let's add a max width of 400 pixels so the inputs don't ever get too wide. It's better visual design. Finally, let's remove that ugly pink background color and replace it with a soft gray color. Now both the first and third sections look awesome. Let's look again at the middle section where we have a visual design problem. Notice that the text is touching the radio and checkboxes. Let's create a new selector for the inputs of type radio and of type checkbox. Let's set the margin on the right of these circles and squares to six pixels. Now that looks much more professional. If you are serious about getting a job in this field, you need to pay attention to these little details and it will make your work stand out. The last thing we need to style is the submission button, which is also an input, but has a type of submit. We can select it like this. There are so many ways to style this input. I will show you one way and hope that you use your creativity to do something different on your assignment. A border can be nice, but today I will remove the border. I am going to use a simple linear gradient from the red I used up here to a darker red. Now that makes the text hard to see, which is bad design. Let's change the text color to white. I will use repetition in my design and use a border radius again. Since this needs to be bigger for touch screens, what would you suggest we use? If you said padding, you would be correct. Let's set the width to 96%. Oops, that's too big. So let's add a max width of 400. If you look closely, you can see that the button does not line up exactly. So as a professional, we will correct this design problem. We also have a lot of space above the button and notice that it is also touching the footer, which is a visual tangent design error. Let's fix both of these problems using a bit of margin magic. Let's set the top value to a negative one REM. That should reduce the space above the button. Now let's add 2% to the right. Two REM at the bottom to put space between the button and the footer and 
at the left to move it over so it lines up perfectly. 2% on the left and 2% on the right plus 96% overall is 100%. Finally, I will add a subtle drop shadow to the button. That looks pretty fancy. Now let's look at some cool pseudo classes we can use with required inputs and valid inputs. Let's see if we can target any input that has a required attribute. In our HTML, you can see that there are three of them. You will learn more about patterns and valid entries in another lesson. In our CSS, let's select inputs that have a pseudo class of required. Then we can style them in a variety of ways. We could add a background color and it would look like this. The problem is that when the form auto fills, it also uses a background color to indicate the auto filled inputs. So that won't work. We could also add a border like this. When these autofill, the active input again overrides the border with blue. As you can see, these others are working, so that is a slightly better solution. What if we used a right side border and made it really thick like this? When the form autofills, you can still see the color. We could also use a left border like this, or a bottom edge border like this. So many choices and so little time. Whatever you choose, you must now match it in the next CSS selector I will show you. Please add an input select with two pseudo classes, one for required and a second for valid. Match what you chose up here and change the color to a valid color. Now the required fields have an asterisk and a color to identify them. They change color when correctly filled out. Now that, my friends, is a good looking form. From small screens to wide screens. Let's upload it to a real web server and look at it on a real phone and see how it looks. I'm using a program called Reflector to display my phone screen on my computer screen. The form looks great. Notice when I touch first name, I get this keyboard. When I touch phone, I get this keyboard. When I touch email, I get an at symbol down here. When I touch website, I get a forward slash and a dot com button. I can select one of the audiences and multiple softwares. Down here under funding, we have a problem. Wow, this is a mess. The browser style sheet is overwriting our CSS styles. So we need to go back and add a line of CSS to tell the browsers to get their grimy hands off our form. This is a good example of how you should not rely on browser emulation. Let's add appearance none to override the default browser styling. We will look at this change in a minute. But in the meantime, notice that the select dropdown no longer has a down arrow to indicate there are options. Let's add our own down arrow. In the HTML, next to please select, add an entity of ampersand pound 9662 semicolon. You can see it here on our web browser. Let's upload our project once again and check our work. The date and course subject are now the same width as the others. The date picker works beautifully and the course subject list pulls up like it's supposed to. Now it's time to check our form against our best practices list.